we're talking about what's on your plate. With the U.S. food retail industry topping $5 trillion in annual sales, it's no wonder why brands are battling for a spot in your pantry or fridge. Food is big business, and as we head into the holiday season, that battle gets fiercer. Unfortunately for consumers, that means the grocery aisle can be filled with hundreds of thousands of dubious claims with the intention of spurring a purchase. So how can we cut through the noise and make healthy and tasty food choices for our families? We'll hear from two Spartans whose lives revolve around food, award-winning author and speaker Michelle Payne and MSU corporate chef Kurt Kwiatkowski. Michelle and chef Kurt will pull back the curtain on food and demystify some of the myths and misnomers fed to consumers. Michelle is a 1993 graduate of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, holding a degree in agricultural communications and animal science. She's an award-winning author and the founder of Cause Matters, a company dedicated to addressing food myths and connecting the farm to food. Her latest book, Food Bullying, How to Avoid Buying BS, dives into the marketing tactics and psychology that pressure consumers into questioning their food choices. Michelle is a passionate advocate for global agriculture and a catalyst for reestablishing food as a means of celebration rather than contention. Michelle, welcome to Go Green, Go Live. Good to see you again. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Tell us what food bullying is and what inspired you to write the latest book. Well, I was inspired to write Food Bullying because I have worked for nearly 20 years in the space of connecting farm to food. And I'm so tired of people being scared of their f food and also scared of where it is grown at. Um, I have spent my life in agriculture and I'm a very proud graduate of the land grant University of Michigan State and the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And I wrote Food Bullying because I continue to see the $5.75 trillion business, as you had said, grow and the marketing claims get out of hand. And what I have found through the research and writing the book is that there's actual neuromarketing techniques that are being used to manipulate your brain to believe certain things that are not true. So I really wrote the book, as you said, to encourage that food should be a celebration, especially at this time of year. If there was one thing that you could remember at the Thanksgiving table is to celebrate the abundance of food that we have today. And I think it's really unfortunate in a pandemic that people aren't doing enough of that, but rather they're fearing for their health and they're worried that their food is going to harm them. Well, Michelle, as the pandemic has pushed more consumers to rely on grocery delivery services, how have you seen food marketing tactics adjust? Well, it's interesting because when you look at food marketing, there clearly is a great deal of halo marketing that's going on. So the psychological effect of halo marketing, think baby food in a um, bottle with a label on it that has sunshine and happy baby in the field, along with probably 10 claims that's on that, that baby food jar or packet. And so that's known as halo marketing. It's the association of something positive with something standard. And to me, food is about, um, it is about nutrition. It's about nourishment. It's about empowering your body. And it's also about the people that grew it. So when I look at the marketing tactics that are out there, um, frankly, I'm not sure they've changed a whole lot, but research has clearly shown that there is actually an uptick in processed foods, that canned foods have become acceptable suddenly after years of people claiming that you need to only shop the outside aisles people are turning to more processed foods and by way of reference any dietitian i have talked to has assured me that canned food frozen food and dried food offers the nutritional value the same as fresh food also we've seen a return to basics uh, I'm very grateful as a dairy farmer that the milk uh, consumption has gone back up. So keep drinking that milk, eating that cheese, and by all means, enjoy some ice cream um, and whipped cream and all of that good nutritious dairy products at Thanksgiving. But the other side of it is to take a look at the negatives the bullying that's continuing to happen. So food bullying is basically about creating negative emotion around food. It's about the label misinformation. It's about the activists um, making false claims. It's about guilt, as you very accurately explained, making people feel guilty about their food. 
And it's really sad. And we've seen more and more of that happening during the pandemic when we have a multifold increase in the needs that people have at food pantries, the increase in hunger, the increase in food security or insecurity rather that I think we're all aware of. That's very sad. But the one thing that I want to be sure people understand is that food cannot prevent COVID-19. Food can't cure COVID-19. Um, certainly your nutrition plays an effect on your immune system, but I think it's really critical that you make sure that you monitor your grocery cart for those false label claims around immunity and those that are fear-based that try to make you have that feel good effect, if you will. So Michelle, how would you define healthy food then? Well, that's a great question. So I define healthy food based upon the four standards that I talk about in food bullying, and those are the health, ethical, social, and environmental standards. Russ, your standards are very different than mine, I'm sure. Um, and I think that everybody has the right to be able to have their own standards around food. And if you know what your health environmental, ethical, and social standards are, you can measure all food claims against those. So for example, farm-raised is what I would consider a BS, which is bull speak as defined in the book, by the way. Uh, farm-raised is a BS label in my opinion, and here's why. Because food is raised on a farm, and there's no need to slap a label like that on that. That does not fit my ethical standard as an example. Sustainable, I'm, deeply sustainability. There is no definition for sustainable food. There's no measurement that can be found that's on that label. And therefore that doesn't fit my environmental standard. So those are just some different examples of how I would define healthy food. And at the end of the day, I think we need to all return to going to the nutrition facts label rather than the front of the packaging. Because as one of my friends likes to say, that's like putting lipstick on a pig. You know, you can dress the pig up and make it really pretty, but it's still a pig. Go to the Nutrition Facts label if you want the real information. And Michelle, tell us a little bit more about Cause Matters and your, your mission there, connecting the farm and the food better. Sure. Uh, I grew up in 4-H and FFA in southern Michigan. I'm a very proud Spartan. I bleed green, but unfortunately, I've not lived in the state since I graduated from Michigan State University. And I have worked for 20 years now as a professional speaker and author, and now I'm giving a whole lot of webinars basically to help people understand where their food comes from, the people behind their food, and to draw the connections around the plate between agriculture, dietitians, chefs, and health professionals so that we can have a better understanding and how to celebrate our food, including where it comes from and the facts and how it really is raised today. Oh, well, Michelle, before we let you go, just summarize some, some thoughts and some tips on how we can think positively about food throughout the holiday season. Think about your favorite memory associated with food and build your story around that favorite memory. My favorite memories happened at the flank of black and white cows on our dairy farm. And uh, my favorite memories around food happened with those beautiful beasts that provide us with food. Your food story is very different, I'm sure. But I would encourage you as you sit around the Thanksgiving table, um, and I will be having turkey to be clear. We were talking pre-show about that. I am a hardcore traditionalist. I love turkey. I grill turkey with a whole lot of garlic and do lots of things to make it taste good, including pour wine on it. <laughs> but uh, really celebrate not only the family around the table, but the abundance on your table, because the reality that we have to face in the United States and all around the world is there's a lot of people who don't have that food. Uh, ethically, I believe it's our responsibility. And one of the things I walked away from Michigan State with was a very large international lens. And I believe it's our responsibility to not only feed Americans, but also to provide food uh, for a world that desperately needs it. So just go back to your food memories, build a positive story and step away from the bull speak that's out there about food because it's not doing you any favors right now and you don't need the stress. Just enjoy your food. Well, Michelle, it's always great to see you and thanks for sharing your passion for healthy food with us on Go Green, Go Live. Thanks for having me. It's always great to be in Spartan country. Again, that's Michelle Payne and, and learn more about her at causematters.com or tune into her, her podcast, Food Bullying, which you can get wherever you get your podcasts.
Our next guest on Go Green, Go Live is Kurt Kwiatkowski, better known as Chef Kurt. He's MSU's corporate chef, and in that role, Kurt designs and sets the standards for all menus in MSU's residential dining halls, as well as develops culinary training for dining hall staff. Kurt holds a bachelor's degree in food systems management and economics and a master's degree from the School of Hospitality Business. Kurt is also a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, having completed their Culinary Enrichment and Innovation Program. Chef Kurt, always good to see you. Welcome to the program. Thank you. It's uh, always good to see you, my friend, and uh, it's always good to talk food with you. Can you start, tell us a little bit just the, the impact COVID is having on your on-campus operations in these days? Uh, so normally we do about 40,000 meals a day. Uh, we have 15,000 uh, Spartans that are living on campus. And, and right now we're doing about 2,500 meals a day to 3,000 meals a day. Uh, but our focus is still the same, right? We're giving every one of our guests the best possible, quali highest quality food that we possibly can. Uh, so e even though the, everything keeps shifting and changing on us, maybe not daily anymore, but, but pretty regularly, uh, we're, we're still delivering those outstanding Spartan experiences to all the guests that we're serving. It's just on, a, on such a smaller scale across yeah. the board. You know, Kurt, this is kind of a, a broad question, a little bit more esoteric, but do you think the pandemic is changing our relationship with food at all? And if so, how, I guess? I, I believe that it is, you know, I, I've never seen so many people so excited about bread <laughs> and uh, <laughs> growing their own vegetables in their garden. And so if that can get people more connected with food, that, then I'm all for it. And, and, and my hope is that people maybe understand what it takes to make something of quality, to put something together, because you can have a good sourdough bread and you can have a, a rock that's super heavy, that has no real, you know, flavor to it whatsoever. And so there's some artisan characteristic to it. And I think people are, are learning that it's not just as easy as adding flour and yeast and, you know, and just stir. And all of a sudden I got this beautiful loaf of bread. And I believe it's connecting people more with their food and thinking about it more, thinking about, all of it together, not just, well, I'm just going to buy this, this, and this. I think people are being more deliberate and voting their dollars specific ways. We have the internet in front of us. So I think people are able to reach out and try different things. And I've seen some interesting things up on social media, <laughs> food-wise. <laughs> well, and Chef Kurt, I did mention, you know, you're the key figure in the development of MSU's dining hall menus. What's sort of your philosophy on healthy food, and how do you navigate the terrain of food trends or dubious superfood claims? What, what I personally try to do is find things that have the cleanest label or the, the, the least amount of ingredients. You know, I'd say for, for the past, ever since I've been in this role, one of the things that our team has worked on is to work to get the highest quality products to our guests. And by highest quality, I mean maybe with the least amount of ingredients to it. So, you know, that package doesn't have 20, 30 different items next to it. it it's just beef. It's just pork, it's carrots. And so there's not a huge list that goes behind it. I think if we can work towards that, the better off we are. And you know, we have the great fortune to have a food procurement team that goes out and sources things from literally all over the world for us. Uh, because again, when we're talking about quality of ingredients, if we're going to cook a Korean dish or we're going to cook an, uh, a West African dish, or we're going to cook an Indian dish. There's very specific spices that go along with that or ingredients that go along with that. And they work tirelessly to make sure that we're able to have access to those so that when we put it on the menu, you know, we have students from around the world that are coming here 
And even if you're not from around the world, maybe you're interested in trying something from there. And so if we're going to put it on the menu, authenticity is important to us. That's been a cornerstone in what we've been doing over the past many years. What we've spoken in the past about food trends and you sort of pointed out to me that we were trending towards more emphasis on side dishes and whatnot. I'm just wondering what continuing trends are you, you seeing? And then obviously this year, when we're all being encouraged to gather in much smaller groups, how will might that affect menus and, and some suggestions you would sure. have? I, I think if we're talking maybe uh, Thanksgiving specific, you, you, you may see turkey, you may not. You may only see part of the turkey. Uh, you may see the, uh, a chicken instead. Um, I think that sides are going to be just as important because, again, we're, we're in celebrate mode. We're, we're enjoying things, so it's really important. So um, it just might not be in as big a fashion. So you only have to buy maybe two or three sweet potatoes instead of five or ten pounds of sweet potatoes. You know, the stuffing's still going to happen and things like that. I think if we're looking on a, on a more global I think one of the things that's really important is responsible agriculture and looking at that relationship uh, with the farmer and, and how things are grown out in the farm, whether it's it's animals or, or whether it's vegetables and fruit and things like that, more responsible agriculture. Uh, Lori Thorpe is a huge advocate for that. She's taught me so much. I can't say enough good about that. And I think another thing you're going to start seeing more of is upcycled food. Uh, and that's a term that I call it as upcycled. So it's the, it's the second hand, it's the leftover, it's the, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. In food, if, if we look through even just our history as, as the United States, we didn't get rid of things. We used up every little bit. And I think for a long time, well, beet greens, I get this beautiful batch of beets from this farmer that grew these beets and they're delicious, but these beet greens, they taste nasty. I'm going to throw them away. Well, people are like, well, what can I do with these to maybe taste, make them taste good? And I mean, personally, I love beets. I'm a huge fan of them, but I'll take those beet stalks and I chop them up and I make something called chow chow. Um, or you can chop them up and make something like jardiner. Uh, so it becomes a sandwich topping or a flavor enhancer to your dish, and you're using every little bit, bit and piece of it. So that idea of the upcycled, the food that would normally get thrown away, the scraps and the peels. Uh, there's a chef from New York that we've had actually on campus talking about sustainability. His name's Jahangar Mehta, and he has his, his leftover soup is what he calls it. It's literally all the vegetable peels. Each day, just go into this pot, and so every day the soup tastes a little bit different, but instead of throwing them away, it's thinking about how can we maybe reuse them all. This year, maybe more than ever, we should maybe hit on some of the food safety tips. Uh, it's <laughs> not like any of these are rocket science. You've talked about them before, about keeping your hands washed and the area clean, but maybe just some, if we can help one person not get sick, sure. sort of clean and keep the kitchen yeah. clean and then a, a second part how long can we keep the leftovers safely that kind of thing yeah you know great and, and i can't stress enough about you know what we call nco or neat clean and organized uh another another thing um that some of my chef friends and i kind of talk about is something called mise en place so everything has a place and it's called you know i am one with my mise my mise is one with me and so when we're prepping all of our food, prep those raw ingredients first and then put them away or put them in the oven and wash your hands and then sanitize the entire area. And then you can be, get to prepping everything else so there's no cross contamination or anything like that. Uh, another thing to always remember, after you're done with your meal and you go to put everything away, don't put hot food in a container and zip zip it shut or put that lid all the way on it when you put it in your refrigerator because it's going to take longer for that food to get down in temperature it's also going to create moisture so warm food in the temperature danger zone and moisture can create bacteria and we don't want that in our system so leave things vented hooded uh, so that you have circulation and the the quicker you can get it cold the 
more you save the integrity of that product itself. And, and kind of that rule is, you know, four or five days uh, should be about it. And then start to look to throw it into the freezer or package it up, vacuum seal it up and, and get rid of it. Uh, uh, remember, uh, turkey temp, uh, we do not want turkey tartare. Uh, we want fully cooked turkey. Uh, <laughs> But there's always carryover cooking too. So temping it at that, if you're cooking a whole bird, temp it at that deep spot in the thigh because the dark meat takes longer to cook than the white meat. And you, you're looking for an overall internal temperature of 165 degrees. But when we pull that bird out of the oven, pull that bird when it's 155 or 160, because as that bird sits for that next half hour before you cut it, because we're gonna rest our bird, because what happens is as that protein cooks, all of the water that's in the protein all goes to the center. And so as we're letting it cool off, we're letting all of those juices and those liquids redistribute into the protein cells. So we give it that half hour rest time and then cut everything up and then temp it again to make sure it's at 165 and you're good to go. Well, Kurt, always appreciate you sharing your expertise. It's great talking all things food with MSU Chef Kurt. And just, Kurt, summarize your thoughts on food as we head into the holiday season here. Oh, uh, you know, I, to me, uh, food is something really special. It's something very special to me. I think food brings people together, and, and hopefully it can bring people together in a different way. You know, we can't be with each other. Food creates memories. So when you're cooking this holiday season, think about some of those memories. Think about the, the turkey and the good times and, and be fortunate for everything that we have uh, because you know we're here and we've got an abundant life. And I'm incredibly thankful every single day. You know, Take that time to just enjoy it and, and celebrate some of those memories. We're, it's just a phone call away to someone. Uh, and what did I hear that Zoom even opened everything up on uh, on Thanksgiving Day so you can have an hour or two and you can be you can be watching sports and and still having family time it, instead of looking at maybe a negative or something that isn't the norm try, try and look at something that's positive and enjoy it enjoy it for everything that it is true Kurt, great to see you as always and, and uh, happy holidays to you and yours oh uh, thank you very much Russ it's great to see you and happy holidays to you and yours as well Take care and go green. Go white.